On the morning of Tuesday the 29th of December 1903, a notice was posted outside of Walton Jail Prison. I, Arthur Price, surgeon of His Majesty's Prison of Liverpool, hereby certify that I, this day, examined the body of Henry Bertram Starr, on whom judgment of death was passed, and at that, on examination, I found Henry Bertram Starr was dead. And with this, it will bring to an end the sad tale of how a young man with a promising career in poetry had ruined his own life by allowing himself to wander down the path of the so-called demon drink. Blackpool, I think it's safe to say, has seen its first share of violence and gruesome crimes over the last hundred years or so, and this next story is no different. Henry Bertram Starr was born on the 27th of January 1872 in Birkenhead, Cheshire, where he would live with his mother and father until his father's untimely death in 1876. Now along with his mother, they would both relocate to Merriport in Cumberland to stay with his grandma for some time. Now it seems that from the age of six, Henry's mother had suffered from symptoms of insanity, brought on by an attack of what was known at the time as milk fever, and she was removed to Garland's Asylum, an imbecile ward at the Cockermouth Workhouse. Even at an early stage, it was obvious to me that young Henry had a bright future in front of him. He was always willing to attend school and being a bright and intelligent young boy. After leaving school, he trained as an apprentice with a man named Mr Thistle, a draper at Maryport, and he stayed with him for nine months until he had to leave due to money issues. But Henry, being a clever and well-educated young man, would seemingly find work no matter what the circumstances were. He went on to say, With agencies of various descriptions, I have earned my bread for the greater, much the greater part of my days. Now he would later write that to his solicitor, Mr J. H. Nicholson of Fleetwood. Unfortunately though, and before he would turn 20, Henry would soon find out for himself the terrible ways in which drinking would begin to send his life spiralling out of control. And after two years working for the Pearl Life Assurance Company, he would be removed from his duties due to his drinking habits, with Henry himself admitting it was the beginning to have an influence for evil over his life. However, keen to try and keep Henry on the right track, his uncle took him under his care, giving him a job as a plasterer and all was well for two years until his uncle died suddenly after a few days' illness. Having reached my 21st year, and used to keeping my uncle's books, etc. in order, together with a certain, though necessarily limited, experience of his business, I undertook, with the permission of the owners, to finish the plastering contracts left unfinished. Now this proved an unwise proceeding. A considerable sum of about £300 had gone, debts which I could not pay distracted me, and of course, the matter could not be adjusted, the end being in sight. Again, drink was my ruin, Henry would later go on to tell. Now in today's money, £300 would equate to just roughly £37,500, so it's no surprise that Henry would be saddled with a huge debt that he could simply not repay. The next five years, Henry would travel as a travelling correspondent for a well-known theatrical publication called Era, and he would also work for publishers by the name of Blackie and Sons but it seems drink had now complete control over his mind and body, and in 1896, tragedy would again loom large in his personal life. On Tuesday, 24th of March, 1896, a loomer by the name of Arthur Fish was walking along the River Ribble near towards Clitheroe, and at around 2 o'clock p.m. that afternoon, he noticed something bobbing around in the water 200 yards from Brangley Bridge. He soon saw for himself upon closer inspection that this was the body of a young woman who was floating face upwards. Her feet had snagged on some rocks and other debris and as the water was only around three feet deep she had come to rest close to the embankment with her arms partly elevated. Now the police were soon called with PC Stubbs one of the first officers to attend the scene. He made his way into the water to retrieve the body. The body was that of 16 year old Eleanor Coulthard a domestic servant who worked for one Mrs Charlton in the nearby village of Chatburn near Clitheroe. Now we will come back to this story shortly, but as you have probably guessed already, Henry will be implicated in this drowning, and in due course he will be later arrested and charged with her murder. So with the scene now set, and after learning about Henry and his struggles during his early life, we arrive at Tuesday 24th November 1903, and inside the premises of Mr and Mrs Jane Blagg, number 76 Lodge Street, Blackpool, 
and the home she shared with her daughter Mary and her husband Henry Bertram Starr. Henry and Mary had married on the 9th of March 1903 at Christchurch, Blackpool, but it had been an unhappy marriage despite them being married for only eight months. And whilst the first couple of months may have seemingly been happy, with Henry finally finding some peace in mind in a loving relationship, holding down a respectable job as a slate labourer, and with all his past demeanours now apparently laid to rest, for the first time in his life since leaving school, he was content with the world around him. But things wouldn't last, and by the end of June that year, Henry would often spend much of his hard-earned money on drink, leaving Mary with little to spend on food and other essentials for their home, leading to many arguments and quite a few threats being made by Henry. It seemed Henry's past was again starting to haunt him. With Henry's drinking now placing a huge strain on their marriage, Mary's mother Jane would confront Henry, telling him in no short terms that it would be best if he left and to go to his aunt, who lived nearby on Harnham Street. Henry took Mrs Blagg's advice and soon left her home to move in with his aunt, Mrs Warren, but this still wouldn't deter him from seeing Mary. And on Sunday, 16th of August, he returned to Mrs Blagg's residence at number 76 Lodge Street to speak to Mary, but he only managed to get as far as the vestibule after being refused entry into the house. Standing there, he would shock Mrs Blagg as well as her daughter Mary. Mary Anna, and I have. I've been with other women, and I have, he shouted loudly. This would come as a huge shock to Mary, and while she obviously knew what he was like when drunk, she never gave thought that her husband would be seeing other women when not at home. The following day, Mary wrote a letter to Henry, telling him never to visit her again. The letter was dated August the 17th, 1903, and was written as follows. Dear Harry, I send these few lines to say I think it is most scandalous shame of you to come as you did last night, after not coming for a fortnight and then you come after 10 o'clock at night and come to tell me to my face that you had been with other women. Where is your love for me? I shall never believe you have a spark of love for me, so you had better stay away altogether until I send for you. If ever a man tried to put his wife into her grave, you have. You needn't come whether you are drunk or sober, for I shall not see you and you will not get in. Your aunt has been to see me tonight, and I have told her all about it, and also Mr and Mrs Terry. You must not think I am going to stand all high I've done and not say anything. You can answer this letter if you think proper, but don't come or else you will get thrown out if you do. I think it is about time you had a bit of sense. You needn't blame my mother for this, for she had nothing whatever to do with it. I remain your wife, Mary H. Starr. The letter would soon be returned with a reply simply showing, Returned with thanks, H.B.S. Henry Bertram Starr. On the 21st of August, Mary would give birth to a daughter they named Lillian, and whilst to many this would be a time to be happy, to Henry it would just be another burden, pushing him further away, it seems, from Mary. But the break would only be temporary, and on the 19th of September, both Henry and Mary would once again reunite, with Mary joining Henry at his auntie's house. However, during this period, Henry would still neglect Mary and their child, often refusing to give her any money to help with her day-to-day -day living, such as buying food or helping with the running cost whilst living with Henry's aunt. Despite her struggles, Mary would stay with Henry's aunt until November the 1st, but with no income and no other way to support herself and her child, Mary made the decision to return to her mother and father, taking the daughter with her. A fortnight later, and on the 17th of November, a letter would arrive addressed to Mary at number 76 Lodge Street. It was written by Henry. My darling wife, I am very sorry indeed that you went away without telling me of your intention and cannot express how keenly I felt in the matter. If you care to come back, I am quite willing to forget everything. But if it is your fixed purpose to live apart, then I must tell you that it is my intention to claim the custody of the child of the marriage within a few days after receipt of this letter. With best wishes, I remain yours affectionately, Henry Bertram Starr. The letter also contained a newspaper cutting that went as follows. Veritas, your wife cannot claim a maintenance order against you so long as you are willing to receive her back. You are entitled to claim possession of the child at any time and hold it against the world. Now this was an extremely strange thing for Henry to do, threatening Mary with custody of their child Lillian if she didn't go back to him. After all, he had neglected the both of them for long periods of time, leaving them penniless and living off scraps. Whether or not someone else was behind this threatening letter of intent, it's hard to tell but one thing is certain, it seemed out of character for Henry. 
Despite the threat to Mary, she would take out a maintenance summons as well as a separation order towards Henry. He would be brought before the Blackpool Police Court on Monday 23rd November and ordered to pay six shillings per week towards the maintenance of his wife and child, but just to add fuel to the fire, the magistrates also ordered that Mary should have sole custody of their child and that she should be bound to live with her husband Henry. We can only speculate but this must have infuriated Henry and whatever was going through his mind no one would truly know, other than at some point revenge would ultimately be his sole aim. Now at midnight Henry was seen by a cabman by the name of John Williams in the neighbourhood of number 76 Lodge Street. Henry at this time seemed drunk and muttering, I'll do it, I'll do it, to himself. The same cabman also saw Henry at around quarter to three the following morning as he passed him by in Exchange Street and this time Williams heard Henry say, I will go and do it. On Tuesday the 24th of November 1903, the residents of Blackpool would be awoken from their early morning slumber and news would soon filter through the back streets and out onto the public pavement, that of a brutal murder that had taken place that very same morning. Just after 8 o'clock, Mary had made her way out of her bed and gone downstairs. Her mother Jane would recall hearing Mary shuffling around and after 10 minutes had elapsed, screams of murder, mother, murder, mother, permutated through number 76 Lord Street. Jumping out from her bed, Jane ran downstairs. As she made her way into the kitchen, she noticed Henry was standing over Mary with a bread knife in his hand, hacking at her, raining down heavy blows in quick succession. Harry, Harry, what are you doing? screamed Jane. Upon hearing this, Henry stopped attacking Mary and ran into the scullery that led to the back door, dropping the knife behind him. Jane ran after him, wanting to close the door, but he turned around, picked up a small dessert knife and began stabbing at her. He caught Jane in the corner of her left eye and also on the right side of her neck. Trying to defend herself, Jane rose her arms to protect her face, but Henry was too strong, taking hold of her arms and dragging her down onto the floor where he began to hack at her arms. Striking her fiercely, Henry caught Jane on her head several times, leading to deep cuts and abrasions to not only her head but also arms, legs, as well as causing bruising to her sides and abdomen. Harry, Harry, do let me go for Hannah's sake, pleaded Jane. It's not clear why, but Henry loosened his grip on Jane at this point, allowing her to get up off the floor. He then made his way out of the back door. As soon as he had done so, Jane quickly bolted the door between the kitchen and the scullery before running out of the front door screaming for help. 29-year-old William Shackleton had heard the screaming as he was walking along Lodge Street. Seeing Jane coming out of her house, his first thought was that of a fire or something had taken place, so he went back into the house. The first thing he noticed was a woman lying on a hearthrug in the kitchen, and whilst there was little blood, he first assumed Mary to be dead. That was until she made a morning sound, and this would be the last noise she would make as by 8.40am she would sadly pass away. As for Henry, after fleeing number 76, he had made his way up to the Derby Hotel, a 10 minute walk at best, and it was here that he was met by Frederick Birchall, an employee of the hotel. Upon entering the building, Henry asked Frederick for a glass of beer and if he could have a wash and something to eat. Now Frederick would serve Henry with a glass of bitter, but he refused his request of using a washroom, saying the hotel had no convenience. He would also reject Henry's question relating to food, telling him it would be an inconvenient as he couldn't leave the bar area unattended. Frederick would later go on to say that Henry had seemed pale looking as well as being a little upset, holding his head down all the time he was at the bar. Henry would finish his bitter before buying a bottle of stout, and after finishing his drink, he got up and made his way out of the hotel. The Duke of York Hotel, which is situated on Dixon Road, is roughly an 18 minute walk from the Derby Hotel, and surprisingly, only a few minutes walk away from number 76 Lord Street and the scene of where his attack on his wife Mary took place. But it was here Henry would make his way to, nevertheless. Malena Piggott, a barmaid working at the Duke of York Hotel, would, when being interviewed, tell of how when Henry went into the smoke room at around 8.55am, he had called out for a bottle of stout. And just as he had done so at the Derby Hotel, he asked if he could have a wash. Malena supplied Henry with his drink and told him, just as Frederick Birchall had also done only a short while before, that it was not convenient for him to have a wash. Henry only spent a few minutes in this hotel, leaving without even taking a sip of bitter from the glass. At around 9.15am, a man by the name of Alonzo Shaw, an attendant of a gentleman's lavatory that was situated in Talbot Square, remembered seeing a man enter the lavatory. The man asked Alonzo for a wash and a brush-up, saying he had been out all night and had gotten into a fight. 
It was at this point that Alonso noticed that the man's hands and cuffs were covered with blood. The man was without doubt that of Henry Starr, and after washing and having a brush up, he paid Alonso before leaving the lavatory. Now, during Henry's visits to the Derby Hotel and the Duke of York and that of the gentleman's lavatory, the police had been called to the scene of the murder at number 76 Lord Street, with those not at the premises receiving instructions to watch out for a man called Starr. And it was PC William Lambert and Police Sergeant Butterworth who stated that it was just after 9.15am when they saw Henry coming up from the steps of the lavatory in Talbot Square. Lambert, proceeding, said he noticed that Henry's cuffs were stained with blood, but he was very far from being drunk. Confronting him, Lambert asked him if his name was Starr, to which Henry replied, Yes, is my wife dead? I will go with you. So with the assistance of Sergeant Butterworth, Lambert took Henry to the police station in a cab. Now once inside the station, Lambert read the following charge over to Henry. You are charged that you, on the 24th of November 1903, of your malice and aforethought, did kill and murder Mary Hannah Starr, your wife, in the back kitchen of house number 76 Lord Street, Blackpool, with a knife. Henry asked, is she dead? The inquest into the death of Mary Hannah Starr would commence on the evening of Wednesday 25th November and after hearing all of the evidence as well as listening to the barbarity of the nature of the crime, it took the jury less than a minute to arrive at a verdict of willful murder to that of Mary and Henry would be committed for trial at the next Liverpool Assizes. Henry, looking pale and haggard and with a dejected demeanour, responded to the charge saying, I have nothing to say gentlemen, I reserve my defence. Originally set for Saturday 28th November, the funeral of Mary Hannah Starr would take place on Sunday November the 29th within the grounds of Leighton Cemetery Blackpool. It was delayed a day due to Mary's mother being present at the Liverpool Assizes on the Saturday. Although the departure of the cortege was fixed for 9.30am, hundreds of people were present hours before and thousands more lined the route to the cemetery with many more stood amongst the graves, all wanted to pay their final respects. The service at the grave was simple and straightforward but Mary's family and especially her father were very much affected by everything that had and was still going on around them. But once the service had been conducted and the family had made their way to the cemetery, there was a big rush of spectators who all swarmed to the final resting place of Mary, such was the huge interest in this case. Now Mary was buried in an unmarked grave and to this day it is still quite hard to find. On Wednesday 2nd of December 1903, 31-year-old Henry Bertram Starr was indicted before Mr Justice Ridley at the Liverpool Assizes for the willful murder of his wife Mary Hannah Starr. Mr Madden, defending, said that communication had been addressed to him by someone who professed to have some knowledge of Henry's mental condition, and he said that Henry's mother was now in a lunatic asylum. So it seemed that Henry's defence at this point were going to try and go for a plea of perhaps insanity, but they needed more time to prepare the case saying it was impossible for any of them to do any justice to Henry at the present hearing simply because they felt that all possible evidence as to his mental condition should be secured and that this time it was impossible. Therefore, Mr Madden would ask for the case to be postponed until the next assizes. However, his lordship would decline the request and fix the hearing for Monday 7th of December. Stepping into the dock, Henry presented a cool appearance and surprisingly, considering all the evidence against him, he pleaded not guilty in a firm voice. Mr Blackwood Wright for the prosecution will go on to tell the jury that once they had heard all of the available evidence, they would be of the opinion that Henry had deliberately killed his wife Mary. He would then go through the facts of the case, starting with Henry's early life up to and including the day of his marriage to Mary. He would then follow this by mentioning Henry's drinking habits and how he had moved out of number 76 Lord Street to go and live with his aunt, Mrs Warren. The letter written by Mary on the day after Henry's visit, the evening before, would be read out, as would the letter written by Henry to his wife. But it would be the details of when the attack on Mary took place that would silence the court, with those listening intently, breathing sighs of shock, when Mr Wright went through the moments leading up to and after the savage attack on Mary. Jane Blagg, Mary's mother would be one of the first witnesses to take to the stand, and she would recall that on the day of the tragedy, the outhouse floor was covered with pieces of cigarettes and matches which were not there the previous night. She would also tell the court that it was custom in the Blagg's house for the first one down in the morning to let the dog out. Now as we have already spoken about, Mary was the first down that morning, and a few minutes later the cries of mother, murder, mother, murder would echo through the house. 
Medical testimony would be given by Dr Johnson, who was called to see Mary immediately after the attack. He would tell the court that Mary was already dead on his arrival, and on examining the body, what he found would be one of the most ferocious attacks he had ever witnessed on another human being. He found two incised wounds on the nose, and a small incised wound on the right side of the cheek. Another wound was clearly visible above the breastbone, which was 1.5 inches in length. The incision had also entered the windpipe. In the left breast, there were two incised wounds, each measuring two inches, and one of them, which probably caused death, penetrating two inches inwards. There were also a number of wounds, varying from half an inch to three inches in length on Mary's arm. The wounds could not have been self-inflicted, and it seemed likely that Henry had pinned Mary's right hand down as he hacked away at her body with his left hand. Cross-examined, Dr Johnson told the courts that the wounds were numerous, with blows being practically rained down upon Mary. The attack on Mary was so vicious that Dr Johnson was reported at the time to have said that some of the wounds were so big that he could have fit a whole fist inside them. Two knives were produced in court, those that had been used by Henry on the morning of the attack. The bread knife had a piece broken off due to the force used by Henry. This was found by Mary Z on the morning of the attack. Another knife, a much smaller one, was also produced in court and this was the one used on the attack on Mary's mother Jane. William John Blaney a Slater who had worked with Henry for seven months and who had also lodged with Henry would be next to take to the stand. He would tell the courts that he last saw Henry on Sunday 22nd of November and that Henry had been drinking heavily and had blue devils and seemed delirious. He stayed with Henry all night trying to calm him down and he had to stop him from jumping from a window at least three times. Mr Madden defending was about to cross-examine Dr Johnson as to the effect of heavy drinking on Henry's mental state of mind when his lordship interrupted saying that this was the first time they had heard of the question of insanity and he did not think the suggestion ought now to be made. This would conclude the case and no evidence was called on Henry's behalf. So Mr Madden, whilst not denying that Henry had committed the crime, appealed to the jury to say that Henry's mind was in such a disordered state as to be incapable of forming a clear and unqualified intent which would justify them to find him guilty, pointing out that he had been a victim to drink and despite the attack on Mary, he had a great affection for her. His defence team would also argue that he was recovering from an attack of delirium when he had visited No. 76 Lodge Street, and that he had no intention of murdering his wife, as he took no weapon with him, but a sudden frenzy overcame him, thus resulting in murder. The jury were not convinced by Mr Madden's closing statement, and only took a couple of minutes to come to their verdict. Guilty. Asked if he had anything to say, Henry replied, Nothing, my lord. The judge then donned the customary black cap and in passing down sentences of death said that he agreed with the verdicts of the jury. You must make the most of the time you have left to you to appeal to Almighty God for the pardon you cannot expect here. You will be hanged by the neck until you are dead and may God have mercy on your soul. Henry, who was unmoved during the passing of the sentence, accepted his fate, turned around sharply and disappeared into the waiting cells below. On Monday 28th of December, Dr Johnson, at the urgent request of Henry, would visit him whilst in prison, remaining with him for around 20 minutes, in which time Henry confessed to Johnson that he never went to No. 76 Lord Street with the intention of killing his wife Mary. He told Johnson that he merely went to see his child Lillian and wanted to kiss her goodbye before clearing out of Blackpool. Mary refused his request and things became unpleasant. Being aggravated, he had picked up a knife and stabbed at her. He could not remember what happened after the first stab, nor did he remember Mary falling or stabbing her while she was on the floor, neither could he recall stabbing his mother-in-law, Jane Blagg. Henry expressed his sorrow for what he had done, as well as to the pain he had caused Mr and Mrs Blagg, and said drink was the bottom of it all. Upon leaving Henry in his cell, Dr Johnson said, Goodbye, keep your heart up, to which Henry replied, Oh, I'll do that. Henry Bertram Storr would be executed within the walls of Walton Prison, Liverpool on the morning of Tuesday 29th of December 1903. Despite a late appeal being made and after being rejected by the Home Secretary, Henry would make his way to the scaffold where William Billington and his assistant Henry Albert Pierrepoint were awaiting. Henry had slept well during the night and from all accounts he partook in a substantial breakfast at around 7 o'clock in the morning. After this he had a smoke and then a drink and was immediately afterwards joined by the Church of England chaplain to whom he appeared quite relaxed. His cell was only around 10 yards from the gallows and after being pinioned by Billington and Pierrepoint, Henry slowly made his way to meet his fate. He made no sound and there was nothing to indicate his appearance 
the awful ordeal he was about to go through. Billington, after placing the white cap over Henry's head and adjusting it accordingly, stepped aside and within a few seconds the signal was given. Henry dropped six feet into the abyss below and in the eyes of the law, justice for Mary Hannah Storr was finally done. The toiling of the bell would soon be heard, notifying those outside the prison walls that justice had been done, and for the next 15 minutes the grim message rang out into the frosty morning air. Henry's body would remain suspended for an hour, as was customary for hangings, before it was cut down to await the inquest. And following the inquest, his body would be interred within the grounds of the prison walls, but the criminal's cemetery being full, it meant his body would be the first to be buried in a new burial place that had only just been recently opened. Now remember how we first started the story with that of young Eleanor Coltard, and how her body was found floating in the River Ribble on the 24th of March 1896. Henry and Eleanor had been acquainted for a short time after the two met whilst Henry was a bookseller travelling around the country. He had visited Clitheroe and began keeping in touch. On March 23rd, the two were noticed by several people walking together near the River Ribble, and not too long after her body was discovered floating in the river, the police focused their attention on Henry, whose clothing was very wet when he was apprehended later that day. He accounted for this by saying he had fallen into the river due to being under the influence of drink. However, it seems his answers were contradicting and he was soon charged with her murder. So whilst he was taken into court and after all the evidence had been placed in front of a jury, he was acquitted of her murder on Sunday 26th of April 1896, and this was simply down to a lack of evidence against him. The jury were not satisfied that the evidence produced could prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Henry had indeed drowned Eleanor, so the only conclusion and the only verdict they could give was one of not guilty, thus allowing Henry to walk away from court a free man. Whether or not Henry did indeed murder Eleanor, well we will never know, but looking at his history and how it was clearly obvious he had violent tendencies, especially when under the influence of drink, it does seem likely he was behind Eleanor's death, and he was able to walk away when he would eventually meet poor Hannah Blagg and the rest, as we say, well, it's just history. On a final note, Henry was a talented poet, having wrote a few poems during 1897 and 1898, with them appearing in several newspaper publications. But perhaps the most revealing is the one he wrote prior to his execution whilst awaiting his fate in prison, and the one he sent to his cousin Mr R McClory. It is finished, work is done. Fold the hands across the breast, trusting that the crown is won. He is weary, let him rest. Judge him not, but let him sleep. Seek not shadow in his light. What if none may o'er him weep? Peace still cometh after strife. All the passion now is gone, calm and still the troubled heart. Leave him with his sin alone, let his spirit so depart. He is tired, let him go, through the silent night of time. Follow not, nor seek to know, dusky valleys of his climb. It is finished, work is done. Fold the hands across the breast, trusting that the crown is won. He is weary, let him rest. Henry Bertram Starr, Christmas 1903. So I hope you enjoyed this story, it is another tale from the past. Uh, we are looking into more stories from the Blackpool era. So if you are listening to this podcast, and uh, you, maybe you're reading this on the website, daysofhorror.com, if you know of any other tales set in the 1800s, early 1900s, let me know in the comments on the website or on the podcast site. Um, also, you could contact me using the various social media tools available, such as Twitter, Instagram, and we do have our own uh, YouTube channel so you can um, visit our website at www.daysofhorror.com all the links are all, are all there but in the meantime guys all it takes for me to say is as you always do take care look after yourselves and I'll be back soon with another tale from the past <laughs>